All right, we're going to get started. Thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that as a land grant institution, the Department of Architecture and Urban Design at UCLA recognizes our presence on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Gabrielino Tomba peoples. Um, it is a pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Alexandra Yaske. Am I pronouncing your last name? Yashke, okay. You know, I should have done the Spanish uh, reading. Um, Alexandra is an architect and an assistant professor of architecture and sustainable design at the University of Texas at Austin. Uh, born and raised in Poland, she holds a, a Doctor of Design degree from the Harvard Graduate School of Design and an AA diploma from the Architectural Association in London. Prior to joining the faculty at the UT School of Architecture, she taught at the Woodbury School of Architecture here in LA. Uh, yes, okay. oh my God, I'm gonna destroy that every time, I, I apologize. Alexandra's interests range from ecological science and thought through definitions and models of sustainability in architecture uh, to cross-scalar integrated design strategies. She has recently participated in an Urban Next podcast series entitled Nature of Enclosure uh, contributed to Log 51, participating in Log Rhythms, a conversation series hosted by Log in the Italian Virtual Pavilion during the 17th Venice Architecture Biennale, and curated Plant Potential, an event series focused on human-plant relations. She is a licensed architect in Italy, where she practiced at Ion, um, a studio that she co-founded and co-directed with Andrea Di Stefano until her move to the U.S., in recognition of the work developed by ION, she received the 2011 Europe 40 Under 40 Award. In 2019, she was the recipient of the Wheelwright Prize with the project title Under Wraps, Architecture and Culture of Greenhouses, where she explored the ecological, cultural, and spiritual implications of the ever more pervasive use of greenhouses in agriculture, horticulture, conservation, and leisure. In 2021, Alexandra received the Digital Futures Inaugural Mark Cassin's Theory Award. In 2022, Princeton Architectural Press published The Greening of America's Building Codes, Promises and Paradoxes. The book is based on Alexandra's doctoral dissertation, where she investigated how building regulations, coupled with green building technologies and incentives, shape environmentally driven design and environmental awareness. I know this is a lot of information, very chronological. I think it's important to go over these to get a sense of the range and scope of work and impact of Alexandra's work. Other projects have included the exploration of aspects of embodied energy, transportation and sourcing of materials, and the impact of codes in mapping of environments, the marcation of legal territories, operational protocols of logistics and control of built environment, highlighting the interconnect interconnections between design, techniques, economic processes, and regulatory mechanisms. One of the aspects that I have long admired about Alexandra's work and research scope is her capacity to engage with a really broad range of scales, topics, constituencies, geographies, historical times, and audiences, while remaining focused on a set of clearly articulated, very precise set of topics that center on urgent questions around environmental and ecological issues. If the scale of ecology connects in her work seeds to territory, Alexandra's work and scholarship includes two the connections between buildings and landscapes, architectural movements and the building technologies that embody them, and the capacity to capture effectively this moment in time as architecture grapples with the connection between long-standing disciplinary questions and the urgency of environmental and climate change. The work is timely as it registers present concerns. It is equally meaningful as a contribution to architectural historical scholarship and effective as a projective tool in speculating both about the near and the far futures. I wanted to share that when I invited Alexandra to come talk, she asked me, what do you want me to talk about? Should I talk about the book? Should I talk about my dissertation? Should I talk about the wheel ride? And I was like, come and talk about whatever you want. And she warned me that this is work in process. So I very much look forward to learning what you're up to right now, which I'm sure will be equally brilliant as a addition to your body of work. Please join me in welcoming Alexandra.
Thank you. What an introduction. It's not at all. <laughs> Um, it's really an honor to be here. I, as Mariana said, I, I lived in Los Angeles for two years when I was writing my dissertation. And at that time, I also taught a couple of design studios at, one, at Woodbury, and it was just simply wonderful. I, I learned so much from the city and from my colleagues and my students there, and I do miss the energy of the city, so I'm really thrilled to be here. Thank you. Um, in this recent period, and I mean the last five, six years, I have been thinking a lot about the frameworks that we use in architecture and about the importance of other domains, about um, the other domains of knowledge, about systems boundaries and, and the mindset in which they originate. And it's curious how we aware of it or not, often stop in front of real or imaginary posts like this one and just don't go further. And so even though I'm not a particularly transgressive person, I decided to entitle this talk No Trespassing Beyond This Point to invite you to do the exact opposite. And before I move on to the main topic, which is this work in progress, um, I want to briefly mention a couple of past projects that Mariana has mentioned, big and small, that in one way or another actually question the limits of our discipline and are an, an invitation to trespass in some form. So the first one is my recent um, book, recently published last year. Now, before I came to the United States, I, I practiced for several years in Italy as part of Studio Ion um, that I co-founded and co-directed with Andrea Di Stefano. And those years really made me realize that the mainstream approach to minimizing the environmental impact of construction focused almost exclusively on building products. And the form was largely ignored and what was even more surprising to me um, was that the influence of the market dynamics and building regulations were completely overlooked. And so, and yet the, the building technologies, and I mean HVAC and solar panels and um, insulation materials, windows, they all depend on various techniques used to support their diffusion and acceptance among, I mean, in the society. and and. These techniques are, I think, equally responsible for the environmental impact of construction. So this topic became the subject of my doctoral research at Harvard uh, GSD. And, you know, I'm, I'm neither a historian nor a building code expert, of course. So I um, approached it really from the perspective of an architect, a young architect uh, whose practice was heavily affected by politics, by regulations, by financial speculation in Italy. And so in that research, I focused on building codes and incentives, uh, those two domains that are commonly considered external to, to the core of our discipline. And, and I surveyed the historical interactions between uh, we could say the ecological movement, um, the techno-scientific advances, socioeconomic agendas, regulatory programs, and architectural discourse even to some degree to try to critically assess how building regulations and green building incentives determine what architects actually consider as safe, healthy, and sustainable. So the research revealed to me how the cultural, socioeconomic, and political forces that influenced the development of the early building codes and financial instruments actually continue to define the character of the current the character of the current building regulations and incentives. And by extension, they continue to determine how we build, how we regulate environmental impact, and how we define sustainability today. And so the book explores, of course, this origins of, I think, um, pretty narrowly defined frameworks and mindsets in which these ideas, and I mean sustainability and green building standards, originate. But it also tries to offer a reflection on how we might be able to 
expand the boundaries of our practice to trigger meaningful change. So the last chapter of the book actually highlights, uh, and that's in form of four conversations, a handful of successful, what I call pre-design efforts, and those are uh, the development of new model codes and standards, technologies and products, uh, but also computer software and financing mechanisms. And, and this is to suggest to some, you could say, how to trespass if one really wants to make a difference. Um, my struggle with this narrowly defined term sustainability also had to do with how we define the spatial temporal system boundaries. And if you think that you know, a relative increase in energetic efficiency, for example, might turn out insignificant if one considers other scales. And yet we often draw the, the boundaries of our architectural systems really too tightly to, to see that. Uh, and so in this project in, uh, that I entitled For Here, Please, that I presented as an audiovisual um, piece in the model behavior exhibition that was curated by Cynthia Davidson of Anyone Corporation and uh, took place at the Cooper Union Foundation. I used the act of coffee making as a model for thinking about the limited systems boundaries in architecture. And, and I reflected on architectural models and the incapacity to, to account for the social and ecological impacts of the production of buildings and on the failure of these models to consider the erratic and wasteful behaviors of those who consume them in ways that often really undermine the environmental claims that we make as, as designers. And in my Wilwright Price research um, and in the lecture, mainly in the lecture entitled Emer In Emergency Break Glass, I use the greenhouse. And sometimes we actually refer to greenhouses as forcing frames. Um, as a metaphor for the reductionism that characterizes Western epistemological, but also importantly, axiological frameworks. And, and I reflect on how this forcing frame attitude is expressed in the subsidies and leakages, but really what that means is this unintended consequences that we tend to place outside the boundaries of our investigations. That's when it's really convenient not to trespass. And finally, in, uh, in a recent uh, paper, Ground-Based Variations, that I presented at the conference last year at the University of Massachusetts, and it's forthcoming in, in an edited volume entitled Multiplicity, I discuss one of the most common architectural symbols, that is the ground section line, as an abstraction that I think should not be confused with the reality of soil, which of course is a dynamic transitional zone that supports all life, but still is a symbol that is, is, is it's a reality that is ignored by, by architects. And in this essay, I also use the work of ecologist Suzanne uh, Simard to draw attention to non-human forms of intelligence, that is mycorrhizal networks that transcend the independent organisms and enable interspecies communication. And, and that helps to reflect on human cognition as well as dependent on these systems and on, its, you know, on, on the environmental context and as embodied in those cognitive webs. I eventually explore also the in, indigenous ways of knowing that demonstrate a, a deep respect for this form of interconnectedness. And two concepts that really come useful is uh, one is holographic epistemology that was proposed by um, Hawaiian, by the Hawaiian scholar Manulania Luli Meyer, and the other one, very beautiful, called Two Eyed Seeing, that was developed by Mi'kmaq scholars of Nova Scotia, and and this is to really question the Western paradigms and its and very rationally framed kind of objective empirical inquiry as the only valid epistemology. So today. This was just to kind of give you a little bit more uh, an idea about some of the past projects, but they are out there on the internet and printed, so I don't want to repeat that. Today I want to um, talk, I want to focus on a story that I have been working on this 
uh, in this period, and that is inspired by my recent travels to the Galapagos Islands. And in this story, I continue to explore similar topics, but this time in search of a more tangible material strategy to um, that would um, a strategy for architecture. But please be patient, because of course, when one tries to trespass, it's risky and it takes time uh, to actually come back home to your own discipline. If you're familiar with the word chakra, it's most likely because this ancient Sanskrit term that can be traced back to the oldest scriptures of Hinduism is integral to many forms of yoga and meditation practices. But the chakra understood as a vital energy center is not the chakra I want to discuss today. In the language of the Quechua communities that inhabit what is the present day Ecuadorian Amazon, the same word, at least as we transliterate them in English, means a swollen garden and refers to the form of agroforestry. Still, now that I have invoked both concepts, it's really hard to resist thinking of the psycho-spiritual vortices that, according to various esoteric yogic traditions, invest our physical bodies with subtle energies as I reflect on the gardens cloaked by the mass of the Amazon forest. Where can these gardens take us if we allow ourselves to believe in very subtle energy? Which divergent realities can they help reconcile? What century-old disputes can they settle? But let's return to the forest before this becomes too esoteric too quickly. Most Quechua agroforestry by the way, um, the photographs were all taken in the Galapagos Islands, but it's the concept that matters. We're not in the Amazon here. So most Quechua agroforestry farms are polycultures in which a principal cash crop, most commonly cocoa, grows along a few additional market-oriented produce, such as bananas or cassava, and other fruit and vegetables to be consumed by the farmer's family and of course, it's livestock. What distinguishes this polycultures from home gardens found in more densely populated regions of the world is not necessarily a higher level of biodiversity even, but the fact that they exist and co-evolve with the tropical forest. In the Quechua chakras, uh, the primary or secondary forest amounts to an average 40% of the farm, but it will vary greatly depending on the size of the farm. Um, hmm. Okay, sorry about that. The chakras will host many different trees. Among the timber species found in the chakras that I have read about, one will find, and this is in Spanish or Quechua, Chonta, Canelo, Junco, Aguano Guava, Cedro, Tamburo, Balsamo, Caoba, Juambia, Batea, Acutillo, and Guapapura, Guapa, Guapayura. Among the cultivated fruit trees, it will be common to spot, and here we have the English terms, avocado, sapote, tangerine, lemon, grapefruit, orange, Amazon grape, soursop, pineapple, a shrub to be precise, and papaya trees. Naming this tree species seems important, even if it's just for the pleasure of the melody, just to recognize them. In the Quechua chakras and in other similar agroforestry systems found across the continent, trees, including those not considered useful as a source of timber or food, shade cocoa or coffee in other places and um, coffee plants, but they also contribute to soil fertility, capture nutrients found in deep soils, and prevent erosion. Among the crops grown for the family, along with cocoa, bananas, and cassava meant for sale, one will typically also find corn, peanuts, and beans. Livestock rearing, mainly chickens consuming plants that are not edible to humans or those that are in excess, will also be always, almost always present. Clearly, a chakra, a fragile garden of human origin, will get quickly absorbed by the forest as a passing disturbance, 
if it's not supported by constant work enabled by a deep understanding of the natural cycles that structure the flows of forest matter and energy. A skillfully staged forest succession management with trees and crops gradually phased in and out is an integral part of it. The notorious exuberance of the tropical forest due to extreme levels of humidity and rainfall means that most labor goes into removing weeds and trimming shrubs and trees. For various reasons, including insufficient monetary resources and lack of proven effectiveness even, but also out of deference to the forest natural constitution, industrial pesticides are rarely applied. So consequently, almost half of the work is dedicated to pruning and weeding. Food derives calories and solar energy power the work and the simple yet powerful machete is the tool that keeps the farm clean. And cleanness is made meaningful in more than just practical terms. Uh, providing the human family, often four generations living together on one farm, with sufficient food and income, of course translated into tons of produce, dollars of salt crops, and kilocalories of vital energy, is just one of the values considered when decisions are made in a chakra family. In many indigenous Ameridian cosmologies, as powerfully exposed by Eduardo Viveiros de Castro, the forest is considered a heterogeneous community of persons. Now, according to uh, Viveiros de Castro, who I actually discovered thanks to Ana Maria Duran, uh, within the context of an amazing course uh, taught at the Pratt Institute by Sanford Quinter and um, Gok and Kodalak, where we were uh, both guest speakers, and so I owe her the knowledge of Viveros de Castro. So according to him, perspectivism is a characteristic quality of Ameridian cosmologies in which the world is inhabited by different sorts of subjects of persons, or persons, human and non-human, which apprehend reality from distinct points of view. So different inhabitants of the world are thought to see themselves as persons. The forest considered as a heterogeneous community of persons is not a material resource or an ecosystem service um, provider, a clever carbon dioxide sequestration machine as we tend to think about it um, in the West. According to the Quechua beliefs, humans, plants, rocks, rivers, animals, and spirits interact as a harmonious, living, collective, and nurture each other, often uh, each other to attain what they call summa causae, that is, good living for all forest persons. In a chakra, natural flows must be channeled with reverence for the benevolent spirits that reign in the forest and for the spirit of water, the ultimate source of life. A well-kept, clean chakra is ultimately a sign of care and respect for the more than human forest community, a community that Aldo Leopold collectively referred to as the land when he called for a new ethic rooted in the territory, only that the origins of the Kitro land ethic are lost in time and completely entangled with their cosmological beliefs. After all, the Kitro chakras might well be an embodiment of psycho-spiritual centers where subtle energies swell up from the physical mass of the forest body. In this multinaturalist reign, again to use Viveiros de Castro's term, centuries-old Western bifurcations fade away and modern ideals wear off. But again, I'm getting ahead of myself. By the way, Vivero de Castro defines multinaturalism, opposing it to the Western multiculturalism, as a form of um, phenomenological unity. He says, one single culture, multiple natures. Um, it's hard not to think about just, um, Jacob von Uxel's concept of Umwelt when reading the following observation that he makes. He says, animals see in the same way as we do different things because their bodies are different from ours. But going back to the Kichwa, Kichwa chakra, the chakras are also powerful in social political terms. Their success relies on several fundamental aspects of human culture, organizational strategies, farming technologies, and cultural values, 
deployed in tandem with a deep knowledge of biology, that is the study of life, here forest life, and they get transmitted among family members and passed down across generations. The chakra represents a potential basis for a modest economic self-sufficiency, food security rather than monetary wealth, that stems from a rich socio-ecological codependence with the forest and a relative autonomy from the centralized forms of government. While highly susceptible to various and interlinked environmental and social pressures, the chakra has the capacity to empower small communities and extended families culturally, socially, economically, and perhaps politically as well. After all, they are the keepers of traditional knowledge, traditional ecological knowledge, and the custodians of the spiritual wisdom rooted in land. The practice can also position them in the center of the global efforts against environmental degradation. If loss of biodiversity, soil depletion, depletion and soil erosion are all aspects of deforestation, the chakra offers a fragile but powerful form of respectful forest stewardship. The Quechua polycultured gardens might be islands in the forest, but they are not, uh, they're far from unique. As a matter of fact, there is nothing strange about the idea of modifying one's landscape. Most species, or should I say forest persons, transform their territories to a greater or lesser extent, but they do it in non-repressive ways without diminishing their diversity. Most species, except for the notorious lemon ants, and um, that are the culprit behind the mysterious monoculture monospecies devil, uh, devil's chakras, and of course, except for us modern humans that tend to perceive nature as a distinct entity to be either eradicated or enshrined. In fact, until relatively recently, our destructive tendencies made scientists believe that all biodiverse forests must have been free of anthropogenic influences. In Cultural Forests of the Amazon, anthropologist William Ballet offers an exhaustive account of the complex history of indigenous communities that have been transforming the Amazon since time immemorial, demonstrating a deep empirical knowledge of the environment in terms of processes and constituents and contributing to its biodiversity either actually culturally conscious of the anthropogenic agency or without distinguishing it from other sources of transformation. Ballet even dares to suggest that to fully understand the nature of the Amazon forest, it's time to let go of the focus on natural ecological succession and frame the discussion around the cultural concept of landscape transformation. Um, unsurprisingly, the Amazon is not the only cultural forest. Evidence of similar practices have been found among indigenous groups in North America as well, all the way up to present day Canada. Again, there are meaningful exceptions to this attitude, but it seems safe to say that wherever traditional ecological knowledge has been spared from the ravages of Western land management practices, indigenous groups who inhabited forests altered them without making them less biodiverse. To the contrary, human-mediated disturbance, as Ballet suggests, is at the root of traditional technology. Anthropogenic landscape transformations, when performed by respectful forest persons rather than irreverent aliens, are a product of co-evolution and the source of traditional ecological knowledge. Traditional ecological knowledge is a broad concept, but Ecologist uh, Fikret Berkis has matured a useful working definition, and I quote, a cumulative body of knowledge, practice, and belief evolving by adaptive processes and handed down through generations of cultural transmission, by cultural transmission, about the relationship of living beings, including humans, with one another and with the environment. Berkis emphasizes that traditional ecological knowledge is more than information, the things we know. It is a dynamic and fragile process, building on experience and adapting to changes. Not unlike gardening, 
not worth it's not worth it that the Mi'kmaq of Nova Scotia that I mentioned before approached the acquisition of knowledge as a form of knowledge gardening. That's what they call it. A process that relies on a long-term collaboration between humans and the plants, animals and microorganisms that make up a local biota. But what happens when the history of anthropic presence is relatively short? And there is little or no indigenous presence, no traditional ecological knowledge to rely on. The Galapagos Islands offer a striking example, but I think also a model for thinking about many less exotic places that desperately need a land ethic. According to the available, available records, people first stumbled upon the islands and completely dismissed their potential in 1535, when the Spanish Bishop of Panama, Fray Tomás de Berlanga, reported to his king after having accidentally drifted off the course of his journey and gotten trapped in the archipelago for weeks, he made no recommendation to add the Galapagos to his majesty's realms. According to the bishop, they were nothing more than useless rocks. And so, before the islands attracted the attention of European explorers and naturalists, for several centuries, the archipelago that remains no man's land successfully functioned as a stopover for pirates as well as for fur and whale traders, who used it to restock on water from El Junco Crater Lake, the only permanent source of fresh water, and food, the numerous and highly nutritious giant tortoises that would be stored alive below the ship deck for months, hence the decimation of the species. The islands were officially annexed by the new, uh, newly formed state of Ecuador in 1832, three years before um, her, uh, His Majesty ship Beagle with Charles Darwin on board reached the shores of the easternmost island of San Cristobal. In the effort to establish its dominion over the islands, the government took a series of immediate steps to populate and develop the new frontier. Wealthy and well-connected Ecuadorians hoping to establish extractive industries and agricultural haciendas, penal laborers serving as sentence, elected officials and policemen, together with a handful of foreign outcasts disillusioned with modern life, were among the first settlers. The colonists who adapted to these inhospitable conditions settled in an environment that was not, ecologically speaking, theirs. Whatever farming tradition and knowledge they brought that they brought with them proved inadequate considering the unique combination of volcanic soils of recent origin, thorny flora, eccentric fauna, and scarce freshwater. In fact, in part for social political reasons, and in part uh, due to the lack of understanding of the local environment, that is the land, most agricultural experiments carried out in the 1800s failed miserably once the governmental subsidies dried out and the numerous panel laborers were no longer there to keep the local vegetation from taking over the neatly ordered fields of sugarcane, yucca, and maize. None of these plants evolved as a species in the islands, and hence, with few exceptions of which later, were not able to survive by themselves. Whoever could, and I'm talking about the humans, return to the mainland to escape the cruel labor conditions. Hundred years after the Ecuadorian annexation in the 1930s, nearly half a thousand people scattered across four islands referred to the Galapagos as their homeland. The few agricultural panel colonists, the infamous El Progreso on San Cristobal among them, are now all history. The highlands of the four inhabited islands, San Cristobal, Santa Cruz, Isabella and Floriana, are a post-agricultural landscape ravaged by invasive species introduced as crops or brought over in the colonists' suitcases by accident. In fact, if visitors get to hear about those new frontier dreams gone awry, it is because of the invasive species, Spanish cedar, 
guava, blackberry, goats, feral cats, mice, and rats that came to the islands with the agricultural colonists. Most people left, but their plants and animals remained, and many of them established themselves to the dismay of present-day conservationists with tremendous success. A handful invaded entire islands and are wrecking havoc in the once pristine Eden. Eden. The efforts to restore the islands to the pre-human condition, in other words, to reset the course of natural evolution, supposedly in rec recognition of Darwin's scientific legacy, is what defines the island's identity today. It's hard to pin down when exactly the archipelago turns from a frontier for economic development and an emblem of Ecuador's struggle for national self-determination into an in international laboratory for natural conservation and evolutionary science. Various foreign expeditions inspired by Darwin's research explored the islands in the wake of his visit, all driven by the desire to preserve them for science, preferably under the aegis of their own government, or at least as a mission overseen by an international institution. It was the eventual involvement of UNESCO and the newly formed International Union for the Conservation of Nature that ultimately spurred Ecuador's strategic decision to formally recognize the importance of the islands for natural conservation. The creation of the Galapagos National Park, the first national park of Ecuador, and the establishment of the Charles Darwin Foundation for the Galapagos Islands, both taking place in 1959, represent the culmination of this process of transformation of the archipelago's identity. The decision to turn um, the Galapagos into a national park allowed the country to become a major player in the global conservation movement without actually falling victim to what some perceived as the new imperialism, a covert version of the colonial pressures that had long threatened Ecuador's independence. And so, since the days of these remarkable events, the life of the archipelago has been revolving around the Galapagos National Park, the well-being of the endangered native plant and animal species that inhabit it, and the fight against the invasives that threaten their survival. Even though over 33,000 people think of themselves today as Galapagenos, and the numbers are growing at an astonishing rate, they're not worthy of conservationist attention. These naturalized aliens are not botanically speaking native to the islands, even though the majority was born there. I suspect that some conservationists secretly consider these homo sapiens newcomers as invasive. But how does one become native? According to Stephen J. Gould, an authority in the field of evolutionary biology, the notion of native plants and I quote, encompasses a remarkable mixture of sound biology, invalid ideas, false extensions, ethical implications, and political usages both intended and unanticipated. According to Gould, native plants are simply the plants that happened to arrive or evolve in situ first. Evolutionary theory provides no scientific basis to defend their superiority. We call them native today because they successfully adapted to a particular location before humans got there, and they have persisted in their adopted habitat till our days. They are, so to speak, rooted in that land. Still, their success does not make them an optimal product of natural selection, as natural selection is simply a mechanism that allows species to temporarily adapt to transient conditions. What might be a transient blip in evolutionary terms will appear unimaginably long to us humans. So we tend to confuse a relatively stable presence with permanence and ecological appropriateness. The idea of universal betterment is not implied in Darwin's theory either. In fact, these plants, but I suppose the same is valid for animals, can be team players that enhance biodiversity or domineering weeds that form invasive monocultures. 
And the same applies to endemic species. They, their uniqueness stems from the fact that they did not expand beyond the geographic location they originated in. And if they tried to do that, they either failed or did not persist long enough for us to have a record of it. We protect them with zeal because there is nowhere else that we can find that exact same form of adaptation. They are unique in evolutionary terms, though in no way best suited or ideal for their environments. And we humans delight in uniqueness. The reason why it makes sense to protect native and endemic species, at least from a natural conservation point of view, is because unlike exotic species, they behave in predictable ways. We know what to expect. A newcomer, on the other hand, can supplant an entire community of plants and animals. Think of kudzu in the southeastern United States. By limiting the introduction of potentially invasive exotic species, we reduce the risk of causing the collapse of an ecosystem. These are all pragmatic reasons, but there is more than natural conservation at stake. I think it's important in cultural terms as well. Countless species, or should I say again, persons, and their unique adaptive intelligence are at risk of being obliterated when natural biodiversity is threatened. Our own traditional ecological knowledge, and this is key to us humans, stems directly from that distributed intelligence. It is an active extension of it. And so, while it reduces our chances of enhancing biodiversity, think of all the exotic species that have actually enriched our biocultural environments. I generally welcome this conservative attitude as a sign of humility and respect towards even just that complex intelligence. But here, a handful of plants here in the Galapagos, a handful of plants and animal species are in the spotlight and the islands desperately need money to eradicate, often in ethically questionable ways, the anthropically introduced invasive species that have taken over the inhabited coastal areas, post-agricultural highlands, and large parts of the park, at times entire islands. This is indispensable even if just to secure the status of the islands as the poster child of the conservation movement and a UNESCO World Heritage Site. But the islands are not just an uninhabited and uncontaminated laboratory for evolutionary science and natural conservation. The Galapagos are far more complex in and it's a reality in which divergent global agendas and local perspectives simply clash on a daily basis. Na nature tourism is a major source of revenue for the Galapagos National Park. And in theory, it can help finance the conservation efforts, but its success entails population growth and urban development. And land-based tourism is expanding at astonishing rates. It's simply cheaper. The Galapagos now has three towns and hardly any fresh water. So there is the need to tackle these impacts as well. And these are not just hydrologic or spatial issues. Travelers are a source of income, but also like imported consumer goods, a potential vector of invasive species. Transportation of goods and people is strictly monitored, but the imports, most food and construction materials are actually shipped in from mainland Ecuador, have to be limited not just to reduce the risk of importing more exotic species. It is crucial to render the islanders more autonomous as well. Dependent on ship deliveries and tourists for their livelihood and constrained to live outside the boundaries of the natural park, that actually accounts for 97% of the land, the residents struggle to reconcile the rules imposed by the authorities with their own aspirations, and there is more than 30,000 of them. Consequently, these issues are no longer just a problem of conservation and must be addressed in socioeconomic, political, and cultural terms as well. Even though, as Herman Daly once pointed out, sustainable growth is an oxymoron, some hope it will somehow work out here in the Galapagos Islands. In the Galapagos, where there is nowhere to grow and almost everything must be imported from, else, from elsewhere to sustain human life. If you 
are just a visitor, especially a cruise-based one, you will most likely leave astounded by the beauty of the archipelago, as I did, and oblivious to its problems. Most international news and social media posts focus on the spectacular endemic species and their endangered habitats. My favorite iguanas, giant tortoises, sea lions, blue-footed boobies, and finches. Plants attract far less attention, and the Galapagos farmers included make the news even less often unless they decide to block the airport during the ele elections or sabotage the conservation efforts in sign of protest. And yet, the farmers, in part descendants of the early colonists whose domest domesticated plants and animals caused the Eden to swerve off its natural course of evolution, could well be the natural solution to conservationists' problems today. Just think of the amount of time that the Quechua farmers dedicate to keeping their chakras clean of weeds. Most of the recent settlers, attracted by high salaries in tourism-related jobs, arrived in the Galapagos, even if disillusioned with life in the city, with no intention to work in agriculture. But the few that do decide to establish a farm seem to be driven by a desire to reconnect with land. Even though this land is not theirs, they want to get rooted in it, make their lives better by improving it. They must be driven by a conviction that ecological knowledge can be built with tremendous patience through practice driven by respect, if not reverence. Fortunately, unlike when the first Europeans wishing to retreat from civilization at world's end arrived in the archipelago 100 years ago, this time round, some farming practices rooted in this land are already present and can be built upon. One can perhaps even talk about a tradition of local ecological knowledge, since most active farms located in the highlands are owned by Galapagos, whose grandparents left the Ecuadorian coast, Andes or Amazon, to settle here, not always by choice, generations ago. These indigenous newcomers, clearly an oxymoron, but perhaps an antidote to what we call sustainable growth and a potential source of a truly transformative evolution, they brought with them a tradition of ecological knowledge and respect for land. These values now run in the blood of the descendants of these few farmers who stayed in the islands when most forced laborers returned to their homeland. And so the knowledge is there. The humid highlands in grand part lying fallow are ripe for knowledge gar gardening. The post agricultural areas that host the few remaining farms are islands in the park. Isolated from the coastal towns, few residents own a car and public transportation is lacking. They are also surrounded by a five meter, that's 15 feet, buffer zone that must be periodically cleared of invasive species to prevent their spread into the national park. The few existing surveys of these largely abandoned areas demonstrate why these measures are actually in place. The invasive thrive in the, hum the humid climate and nutrient-rich soils, but the surveys also point towards practices that are ecologically beneficial. While pastures and crops cover more than 40% of all farmed land, forms of agroforestry and silvopasture, that is forested areas used for cattle grazing, are emerging in part due to the revived interest in shade-grown coffee. The Galapagos version of the Quechua chakras are budding out of sight in the isolated highlands. Only that here, the forest is returning to the farm as more and more farmers are helping reforest agricultural land with native species. You will most likely never see these farms if you tour the archipelago on an island hopping cruise, although the land-based visitors also hardly ever venture into the highlands. Who wants to see contorted guava trees and formless blackberry bushes? Over the past two years, I actually visited several farms located on San Cristobal, Santa Cruz, and Isabella Islands. 
Now, these visits took place within the framework of a multi-year travel-based design studio that I co-teach at the University of Texas. Um, and the program was conceived and organized, and I want to recognize that by my colleague, Professor David Heyman, in collaboration with the University of San Francisco de Quito, that has a research and education-based center, center on San Cristobal. I'm really, really grateful to David for the opportunity to, to co-teach this course and travel to the islands together with our students, and really grateful to our local USFQ host and native Galapagueño Andres Pazminio for the knowledge that he has been sharing with me during these years. And also to Marisa Paz, who is a Quito-based architect and USFQ faculty for her support during the trips. None of this would happen without them. So, now, I am actually an avid coffee drinker, as you now know, because I mentioned before the project about coffee. So I was initially intrigued by the fact that this colonial commodity was grown in what most visitors assume to be a pristine laboratory for natural conservation. But this was before I learned about the early colonists and all the plants that they tried to grow in the archipelago. Caffe Arabica, the Latin name for coffee, was among them, and it established itself in the islands without becoming invasive. To my surprise, I found several small and locally owned shade-grown coffee farms and was stunned by their biological uh, diversity. Not only were these species rich, rich chakras full of many edible plants uh, and several non-subsistence ingestibles known on the continent for their ritual uh, uh, potential for very psychoactive properties, uh, something that was brought to my attention. But to my surprise, they were also full of timber. And this issue matters greatly to us architects. Currently, most materials used in construction in the Galapagos, uh, steel, concrete, are non-renewable and all imported from mainland. While these farms are a potential local source of renewable resources. And in fact, uh, David, Andres, Marisa and I, we've just started a project that is meant to um, remove and test some of those local native introduced and invasive timber species uh, and test them for construction structurally. And we, um, because to do something like that, we needed a permit from the Galapagos National Park. We have just received that permit to uh, test 10 species, very carefully described and, and listed, manzanillo, jelly, matazarno, guava, guayava, cedrela, guadua, algarobo, caoba, aguacate, that is avocado, and cascarilla. Um, it took a year to get that permit. Still, what makes this Galapagos chakras so potent is the integrative, integrative, sorry, if not reconciliatory nature. On the few farms that I visited, I saw farmers picking what we refer to as stimulants, that is the non-native coffee, harvesting plants that we call food, they introduce fruit and vegetable species, and calling what foresters call timber, for example, the invasive Spanish cedar. But I also saw them planting, planting native tree species and the endangered, for example, Matazarno and Scalasia trees, and removing what is classified as invasive, the omnipresent and aggressive guava trees, but also passion fruit, etc., etc. The farmers were doing it to shade coffee plants, to protect their crops and build structures, but they were clearly acting in attunement with the land, the more than human community of persons that they feel integral part of it. Of. They were also driven, I think, by an understanding of and, and a deep respect for the work done by the park authorities. And this to me was a sign of a potential reconciliation between natural conservation and culture. The Galapagos without these productive agricultural areas is doomed to succumb to a typical pattern of development, one based on an incessant flux of imported goods and tourist cash. But the highlands, if understood, supported, and celebrated as an integral part of the islands, can take the archipelago on an alternative course. If anywhere, it is here on these farms that an ethnobotany of the Galapagos, 
its food-related, medicinal, technological, and entheogenic chapters can be written. And so we need to pay attention to the machete-equipped farmers in the Galapagos, but also elsewhere. They helped avoid food shortages during the pandemic, but their potential is far greater than that. They are developing a material culture through gardening. Like those psycho-spiritual energy centers that invest Hindu bodies, the Galapagos forest gardens can help re-entangle the bifurcations that underpin Western science, technology, and culture. It is for this reason that the chakra, as a model, is also relevant to more than just the isolated Galapagos. Paradoxically, like the islands, our modern way of thinking and acting are simultaneously insular and totally dependent on external subsidies. To survive and thrive, our cultural practices and social political institutions must get rerouted in topos, in the land. Um, is this essay entitled Plant Persons More Than Human Power in Indigenous Higher Education, in which the authors, uh, Keith William and Susan Brand, referring to Robert uh, Warrior, point out that indigenous ontologies are based on topos, on territory rather than logos or the word or discursive reason, which forms the basis of dominant European ontologies. In very terms, institutional practices rooted in territory, directly or indirectly, offer a productive response to neoliberalism. In other words, topos becomes the potential new ground for action. We could all benefit from this form of gardening, regardless the size of the island that we inhabit. Finally, the chakra story is a parable for architects as well. It's an invitation to trespass beyond the boundaries of our discipline and get implicated in transdisciplinary exchanges, because it is in the field, I believe, that the future of building can be materially reimagined. And so, trespass with audacity and go gardening. Thank you. Thank you. Is it okay to take some questions? Of course, yeah. Still a microphone. Oh, that would be great, yeah. Thank you so much. Um, I, my question is a little meditation, so bear with me. First, I was thinking that uh, you warned us that this was working in progress. And I was thinking that uh, I always love to meet terms more than final reviews. <laughs> Everything is, in a sense, to be done. And I love that at the end of the talk, you sort of twist the sentence on the relationship of this research to the production of architecture and the production of architectural knowledge. One of my questions was, what can architecture do in a context like that? But secondly, how does architecture, knowledge, and production connect to the knowledge that you're offering? And I was thinking that in terms of the different modes of production, we have sort of these uh, vertical practices where you associate it with specialization, where you become very knowledgeable about one thing. And we have the horizontal practices or the relational practice where we're trying to understand the deep and long histories of, for example, the material. I was thinking Andres Hage came to give a talk uh, last year that connected the glasses in skyscrapers in New York with extraction practices in Africa, mm -hmm. right? And how important it is to know those histories and connections to the social, political, the economical impact of something like a piece of glass. Mm -hmm. And so you ended with a piece of timber, and we know how a lot of the future of the construction industry in the context of sustainability discourses is associated with mass timber and timber practices, but that timber comes from somewhere. 
that it needs to be moved, it needs to be extracted, it affects kind of the local geographies and so on. Um, I swear, I, I'm going to try to share the question here. <laughs> so what I really found interesting about this talk was the big history that you offer today that makes us think about the impact of timber, right, for example. And whether like, or not. So beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> More than um, human species. <laughs> So, um, but interestingly enough, you were also reading all of these in the context of an island. And the island with its geographical boundaries and what's its disconnection, but it's how it relies on support from mainland and so on and so forth. And how easily we know when we can up all that whole food when it took to get into that shell. And how architecture has been guilty of not engaging with that history to produce the new environment uh, is associated from those sources. So um, I was, I think, we're trying to learn about ecology, about sustainability, about climate change, and the role that architecture plays uh, in all of those areas of knowledge. Uh, and in the sense, I think, it is that brings us to the relationship between landscapes and the environment in one way or another. So if I can try to tease a little bit further from where you left the sentence, what can architecture do to become knowledgeable in these big histories and not operate blindly uh, in the context of the impact that our practices have and I only am pushing through this because I saw your rule right lecture and somehow you started with greenhouses by doing that up in the world. Uh, how do we go back to the greenhouse if that is the architectural manifestation of the world offering an alternative to it? Um, what can architects do? How do we operate? We go gardening. We go I, I, I am joking, but I, I am not, actually not. Um, I think what I found really striking when I ended up on these farms, and I really went there because of coffee, I promise. Although I was in the Galapagos with a design studio that was exploring the issue of materials, so we were talking about the fact that you know, 97% of all the materials are imported. They're building using concrete, like the typical types of construction that we find all over, you know, all uh, everywhere in the world. And and at the same time, I went to these farms and I realized that they were already working with international non-governmental organizations and also the park people and local organizations calling, uh, removing invasive species and planting native trees. And some of it was being used as material. But so this in itself for me was fascinating to see. And I, when I did the plant potential project, um, it was one moment in which we discussed this issue in the context of Hawaii with my students where there is a native, uh, sorry, there is a tree that it's not invasive, but it's dying because of um, of a fungus, and it needs to be removed. And we're talking about how that could become a material. So that was something I was already aware of. But when when we were in the Galapagos, I realized that there it was just all so visible and so clear, just because it's one, it's an island; two, it's this lab for conservation. And three, well, it's an island, so everything is important, imported. And, and so it was really interesting to me to go back to the little towns and listen to the conversations and realize that people were absolutely not connecting this to reality. So there was the reality of the countryside, um, or the highlands, as they call it there, because they're all uh, in those, um, well, highlands and the issues of the towns. And yet I could totally see a potential connection only if the farmers, the agricultural communities were actually recognized for, you know, recognized for what they contribute to all communities across the world. And so to me, that is really important that 
it's not just about going to find forests and work with foresters, which I think is really important, and I know many architects are already doing that, to understand where the timber comes from. But it's also recognize those connections and synergies that exist between food production and um, biodiversity protection and material resource extraction and try to create multi uh, sorry, interdisciplinary teams where each of us understands one of those aspects, but together we can actually leverage them to achieve more than one thing and they support each other. Like you will not have that farm just for the timber. It's there because of coffee, but at the same time, there's all this other potential that in part is architectural. And I think it's really, really interesting to, to explore. There are of course issues that are very complicated because the park is very scared of using invasive species as a material because they worry that it's going to encourage people to you know, plant more of those trees. Uh, but I think this kind of things can be uh, controlled. So I don't know if that answers <laughs> to the degree of no, question. Yeah. 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 It said it's it's what the use it's of local? it's local yeah. Or are they also exporting? Oh no, there's no there no. Something. It's local and it's really mainly limited to either those farms, so the people who you know call the trees, they use them, and also to make furniture. Uh, so that's one reason uh, is that there's very little um, understanding of the structural properties of most of those uh, timber species in ways that would be standardized enough for our society to incorporate it into the architectural practices. And I think that in itself is an issue, although in the Galapagos, the building code is very lax and you know it's not like here where you have to have the same standards. But still, if you want to introduce a new material, you have to know how it behaves. So that's what we're also trying to start, to understand how these materials perform and introduce them formally into our discipline. So that's like our effort in terms of the, the, the strictly speaking architectural uh, knowledge and expertise. Well, that's kind of also structural engineering, of course, but recognizing that that's important. That's where the building codes come in as well. Like you can't do any of it if it's not incorporated into the standards. Uh, so to me, that's fascinating, but it's fascinating as part of this big integrated uh, set of relationships where different aspects of our life, of our material culture come together in that one garden. So that's why I say it's about gardening. Hi, suppose because we're all artifacts here that we keep pressing this into what's at stake for architecture yeah. or from architecture. And it seems like given your model, we would want building to become part of the chalk. Is that right? Yeah. And so then I think, well, what really struck me in one of the things you said was, um, among the many things that are very striking about the work, that there is no such thing truly as a native species. But basically everything's invasive. It's just whether it survived longer or seemed to be there earlier. So one model would be for architecture to turn it from being an invasive person to a native, like the coffee plant did, or yeah. this dude, right? But then I wonder how you evaluate that, because conservation theoretically then becomes irrelevant. It's only a matter of time instead, right? So, okay. Is there an answer in what you were just talking about of sort of building codes? And would you next be looking at, say, settlement patterns and uh, smaller scale kinds of building to look for the coffee plant among architectural interventions? You know, if I, 
if I understand correctly, like where where are you going? Of course, it's it's always a set of interrelated issues, and of course, nothing can be resolved with just a timber, or by developing you know material for a, an alternative material for construction there. It is about land use patterns. It is about the boundaries of where we're building and where we shouldn't be building. It's about how much tourism we accept there. Uh, it's it's about many different things. But I think what's what what to me is fascinating is how that chakra, the agroforestry, is also a model for thinking about the integration of different issues and resolving them together. Because that's what happens in them. It, it's never just about one thing. And, and I think that's something that as architects, we often fail to do, is to think about those many issues at the same time. Um, the problem there is that it's very hard to convince the park authorities to open up to these conversations. But they are also aware of the fact that there's so, there's so much they cannot do on their own. And, and at this moment, the farmers, very often, they are their enemies because they, um, they don't really want to obey and they don't want to comply with some of the regulations. So if there was a synergetic relationship where there is a possibility to fight the invasive species while farming, while extracting resources for construction, I think that could be a way to rethink a little bit how people even perceive conservation as something very isolated, how tourists perceive it, because tourists are not aware of this pot potential relationships. And so they live with the idea that the farmers and the towns are bad, the conservation is good, and, and it's very black and white, very insular in that sense. And, and of course, no one says to start now farming across the entire park. That's not the idea, but the, the the fact that even just on that fringe that is massive and long and infinite, that would be enough to resolve, you know, that was treated in a different way where there was a synergetic relationship. That's a place where a new culture, a new material culture could, I think, be born through gardening. And, and, and so... Uh, that's why I think in cities, big cities like Los Angeles, you know, not we don't think enough about farmers and about what they do and, and, and what they potentially bring to our lives, both in terms of food, but also materials. So that in, in part, I think, is one of my interests right now is looking into those communities and, and even just um, bringing them together through a discourse, like just talking about it uh, with students, about the importance of going out there and understanding where these materials come from and and supporting those communities as part of the urban network. Um, they just said something that I wanted to ask uh, if I understood what she meant and what you thought. You asked if architecture could be considered a forest creature. Yeah. Say it again. Is architecture a forest creature? In, in the way you define forest creatures, which basically is where all the oh. species are. Oh, so I misunderstood your question. Right? Oh, but it's many parts. Many parts, but it's it would, like you would advocate architecture to become a forest, forest creature. Person. Yeah. Forest person. Yeah. Well, yes. Yeah. Why not? Yes. Can you say yes, no? Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. But a respectful forest person. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Respectful. I think what that's... What the other ones? Aliens. 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 I think what's really... I'm sorry, Dana, if I misunderstood, but um, I think what's really interesting is that there's also no architectural culture there. As much as there was for a long time no... Ecological knowledge, traditional ecological knowledge, there is no traditional architecture. So all of that is to be reinvented. And I think that's another issue that's really interesting is to see how those plants and their uh, properties and the way we can handle them as architects can express themselves as a material culture 
in architectural terms as well. Uh, that's fascinating. That's If that can be born from land, from that land, that would be beautiful. Otherwise, it's just concrete and steel rebars. Yeah. Thank you so much for the conversation that you were hosting today. I would like to know more, just as yourself, my question is all over the place. <laughs> but I, when you started to say the conversation was about coffee, but then you were exploring material alley and using those materials through. Material collection, instead of those material collections, and uh, using those for structurals. Um, I'm really curious on how connecting those symbiotic relationships and how to connect them to uh, the user of the space and the building codes, and how like maybe we could deepen those relationships and understand them for a healthier space for a user and kind of bring in that evolving and adaptive of natural selection into the new realm of spaces for future use, if you understand. I'm not sure. Um. So you're talking about, hang on, I'm not, I, I don't quite understand the question. The, you say the relationship between the coffee species Understanding the example. So, uh, you were in the Galapagos Islands to study coffee because we were interested in coffee. And then you start to think about how we could utilize a byproduct of the coffee. So, understanding that linkage of questioning and how we could garner that in um, the architectural realm of relationships and understanding how the user of the space, the health of the space because of the building codes and how to evolve for better natural selection of adapting these spaces to a user of the future. That's complex. Um, first of all, I, you know, it's, I didn't really go to the Galapagos, so maybe I didn't make it clear. I, we, we went there with students to, uh, for a design studio, and the trips to the farms were my own uh, personal investigation into, into coffee. But the issue of materials and construction, of course, was uh, on my mind, because not only I'm an architect, but I was there with students thinking about how to build. Um, I think what was really fascinating was to just see the potential synergies that exist and, and also how in the tourism itself, there is a potential to explore, expose that to people and make people more aware of that by, and, and that's an architectural issue sometimes, helping people to set up, for example, a farm in a way that is conductive to visits and and visits that not only focus on coffee and making coffee, but also on all the other aspects of, of that farm, including uh, materials. And, you know, when I was there, I asked questions that were like, no one asked us these questions because I asked them about how the foundations were connected to that wood and why that species and not another one. So, you know, there was, Suddenly, we, I realized that this, there were structures that were made out of a coffee plant, and 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 the whole universe kind of emerged from my own curiosity and the fact that I'm an architect, but I also like coffee. But it's not something that is kind of offered to people uh, when they go there because those things are very isolated, uh, and and so I think that's for me as an architect, it's a beautiful space for a project as well. Like, how do you organize the spaces in ways that are both productive and organized open for uh, a tourist experience, right? A visitor experience in ways that emphasize this uh, 
there's different synergies. I don't know if that answers to some degree your question, but I might be uh, missing the questions to me. <laughs> Thank you so much for that sure. Um, so I kind of wanted to take it back to um, building codes for a second. And can you speak up a little bit? Oh, sorry. sorry. Yeah. Um, I kind of wanted to take it back to building codes for a second. And kind of the impetus of building codes is to provide like health, safety, and welfare for like humans that are happy in the building. And so it's historically determined the kinds of materials and the material culture that we currently live in is determined by this idea of like health, safety, and welfare, like fire and, and fire protection and all that kind of stuff. And so I guess when you're investigating these new materials that are within this, this chakras, do you have to like recalibrate this idea of health, safety, and welfare so that they can be like um, like pliable materials. Mm. Uh, that's that's an interesting question. Um, I think it's they're slightly different because of there's way less emphasis on codes, or actually they're much less strict, but that doesn't mean that one doesn't think about it. Of course you think about it because they're also trying to um, put a little bit more order in you know, the way they're building there. But what's interesting is that there are, of course, the same issues that you have to look at. You, you're thinking about you know, structural stability. You're thinking about issues that have to do with moisture, that has to do with health, welfare, and, and safety, right? And, and so that's why it's so important to bring architects and structural engineers to the table and be able to test those materials in ways that are uh, directly related to all we know about you know how we use materials and and what the problems can be and um, and very but very often from the conversations we realize that for example people were worried that this materials would be uh, not performative enough in terms of um, issues that have to do with moisture, for example. It's very humid there, right? But at the same time, it was clear that it's only because people didn't know how to use them properly. And so that's also where, you know, uh, standardizing not just the material, but the ways things are put together, uh, how materials are used, that's very important so that people don't get immediately discouraged and say, oh, that doesn't work, but just because they're using it in, a, in an improper way. Um, so it's, of course, you know, it's not the my, like primary consideration at the beginning when you start a research like that, um, but it becomes very important when you start understanding the properties of different species and understanding, you know, how they contribute to health, safety, and, and welfare. But having said that, I want to emphasize that, you know, in the quotes, it's very, very narrowly defined. We're talking about human health and safety and welfare in an isolated building in a very isolated time scale. And the building code doesn't really consider the welfare of the environment, for sure, but not even of very often of the communities. Uh, that will be affected by a poor construction method that maybe is cheap and quick to construct, but absolutely not safe, safe or environmentally uh, sound after 30 or 40 years, right? So I think that's where you have to start thinking about a balance between that health, safety, and welfare that we traditionally think about, you know, about a building, and the long-term uh, and, and uh, large-scale um, health of the environment of which we are part. And it's very difficult because we're just not trying to think like that. Thank you. Yeah, I could probably have a lot more. 
No, 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 use the microphone. I don't hear well. Um, thank you for the talk. Um, something that occurred to me, I, I just wrote something down in the beginning. You mentioned um, involving and learning from other domains of knowledge. Um, I, I think just as part of your introduction. And <clears throat> I'm thinking about the kind of knowledge production that's happening on the farms you described. Uh, and it seems that it has a kind of like immediacy, a sort of necessity, maybe like a sort of small systemic way of thinking that comes out of an immediate kind of set of observations. And, mm -hmm. um, and that is like a domain of knowledge, as you described. Um, and then you, you also mentioned, um, I think recently, just with the, <clears throat> excuse me, with the Commission of the Park, you're going to begin this. Um, uh, the study of the different woods that are produced as, as mentioned, the byproduct of coffee. Mm -hmm. And that version is I, a very distinct domain of knowledge, kind of an architectural epistemology or way of thinking. And I, I, certain, I see the utility there, and I think you mentioned it earlier, like this, this, in the cities we don't think enough about farms, and maybe there's like a nutrient loop that we can close at a sort of macro scale. But I'm, I'm wondering, when we apply that sort of architectural domain of knowledge, or the, or let's say that it's rooted in a kind of like practice-based data gathering kind of process, and we apply that to this other domain of knowledge, which has developed in the farms you described. I, I, I sense a certain tension there that maybe some things can be lost in translation from sort of this like immediate kind of like I don't want to say micro, but it is kind of a micro scale. And then sort of the, the instincts we have as architects to kind of like extrapolate out to the macro scale. And I guess I'm just wondering how you kind of reconcile that sort of, um, I think that sort of mm -hmm. step in between those two yeah. kinds of knowledge. I said, I, that's a great thing to think about. Um, I think that you know, in the beginning, I mentioned this concept towards seeing that comes from the um, Mi'kmaq communities in Nova Scotia and Canada. And what it is that they, they, they refer to by using this concept is a way of bringing together Western knowledge and scientific forms of inquiry and indigenous forms of knowledge. And, and I and no one says it's easy. There's like a whole scholarship about how to do that. And I definitely don't have answers. I'm not, of course, I don't come from an indigenous you know, community. I come from Europe. I'm not even American, so it's even more complicated. But what I think is really important is to be aware of that tension and explore it as part of the problem. Because certain things, to my mind, I just cannot be scaled up. So there's a certain limit to how much we should be trying to scale things up. So perhaps, you know, maybe what we're doing there, it only works for that community. And yes, our scientific knowledge of the structural properties will help them to incorporate that into what they're doing in towns because the towns are much more exposed to this ways of working and that's how things work there. But at the same time, you don't want to lose the connection to the farmers who know exactly how to use this wood because I've seen it being used. You know, the, the questions that some people asked in the town were, I thought like, these guys up there, they have the answers. I've heard the answer. But these two worlds just don't talk to each other. And so I don't think it's one or the other, but I think it's very dangerous to try to say, hey, we found a solution, now we're going to extract all the invasive species by helicopter from the Galapagos and ship them to Ecuador. It's not what I'm talking about. Um, that would be totally just uh, wrong. We're talking about trying step by step to come up with a solution for them. There's also, you know, it's true that the Galapagos Park operates in ways that are very scientifically, uh, I mean, based on Western science. So when you're talking to these people and they're in charge of all this uh, processes, like you can't just take out a tree if it's native, it's, it's forbidden. I mean, in many places, of course it is, but there it's even more so. So because they work all the time with scientists, with ecologists, botanists, and they follow certain you know, uh, scientific protocols, 
it is very important to bring those two ways of working together. Um, yeah, but it's, it's a really fascinating issue. Yeah, thank you. A lot to think about. Um, I have a lot of questions, and I really like the title of like, your essay. I guess I'll just read about it when it comes out. But I'm curious, like, what multiplicity means in the context of that? And are you thinking about contemporary arch architecture born from like everything you're talking about? But um, I guess to simplify, like, how do you, and especially after like, being there and teaching design studios for so long um, in this kind of context and in a certain community, like, how are you thinking about this advocacy for like slowing down what you cited and like a lot of the people that you cited up there, like that's the foundational element of what they're talking about. How do you think about that and like this kind of, I think what's happening naturally already in architecture, it's moving towards more systems based thinking model, but how do you like advocate that and think about that in like a pedagogical way and how does that impact like your teaching and mm -hmm. or um, you know what I wish we could do is one thing that I think would the only thing that would work is a design build there and and I say that because we realize that working with materials that you don't know in terms of standards like you don't have the abstract knowledge of them that has been codified and you know drawn in manuals and that you can just take and, and you have no precedence. It's very hard for both us and the students to speculate about that in a design project within you know in the context of a design studio if you don't just try to make it. And and I've been really struggling uh, to deal with that, we did two iterations of, of the studio where we made, you know, models and even tried to use uh, types of materials that resemble more irregular, uh, you know, pieces of timber that are all contorted and, and stuff that you see there. But it's very difficult uh, because it just doesn't scale the same way up and down. And, and so I think it just emphasizes the need for more hands-on instruction, education that is design build type of education, which is difficult, of course, because it takes a lot of time. Um, it takes a lot of resources. And there it's also very difficult because you can't just go and build things uh, without a permit, right? Uh, but I think that would be the step to work with those people and bring, of course, I mean, it's nothing new about it, but bring our expertise, our capacity to think in abstract terms and put that together with their really kind of embodied knowledge of the materials and, um, and the techniques and, and work on that. Uh, we are not there yet. Uh, yeah. Thank you so much for all these questions. They will help me push this further. I was going to say that we existed in like small <laughs> audience, um, and even like the audience that we're talking about questions that range from energy to global markets. Yeah. So thank you for being able to think about all of that and for taking us outside of you know our normal class of entering architectural questioning. Thank you, Mariana. Thank you for being here.